Okay. Let me get us back here. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Perfect. All right. I'm going to try to make this smaller, though. Okay. There we go. Perfect. So this is our bacteria review part one. Some things are review even from what we just looked at. So I'm gonna fly through a few of these components and others are new. So when we get to the individual bacteria, we will spend more time. Again, remember we can classify our cell walls as gram positive or negative. And I mentioned that we can classify our bacteria as by shape. We'll find that there's two major categories uh, spherical, which we'll call cocci, and cylindrical, which you'll hear rods or bacilli being used interchangeably. Our gram positive, we've already talked about some of those main bacterium and the reason why it's gram positive, because it has that really thick peptidoglycan cell wall. We're going to be focusing on our gram positive bacteria in this slide set. Our gram negative bacteria, we're going to focus on in the next slide set. And remember, this has a um, two plasma membrane with a thin cell wall in between, and the external plasma membrane has lipopolysaccharide, which is a fat sugar combo. Um, gram negative bacteria are typically harder to control with antibiotics, and gram negative bacteria with this LPS, this lipopolysaccharide um, endotoxin. I do have a little um, reminder of the symptoms that can be caused by endotoxin. We don't have one for the exotoxin category because each exotoxin is specific to the bacteria involved versus the endotoxin since it's really lipopolysaccharide and um, it's the different things that activates within the body, we can kind of categorize it as causing these things. So edema, nitric oxide um, release, which leads to hypotension, disseminated intravascular coagulation, which could lead to death, um, outer membrane, it's on the outer membrane, uh, activation of TNF-alpha and IL-1, which are our pro-inflammatory cytokines. Uh, it has a component called the O antigen, which causes it to further like activate these different um, inflammatory processes. It's heat stable, so it doesn't break down from high temperatures, and it will cause our neutrophils to move um, to chemo tax to that specific area. So it'll cause even more um, inflammatory responses by our neutrophils getting involved. And we can see the areas that it activates. So macrophages being one, that's where we get kind of a lot of stuff that gets released. So our inflammatory cytokines and nitric oxide uh, complement being the other, which we'll look at in our immune system as part of our innate immune system, which is what triggers our neutrophils as well as causes that increased uh, hypotension and swelling and edema. And then tissue factor, which is what can lead to the coagulation cascade and DIC. So LPS does a lot, but it's specific to gram negatives. And so we will talk about our gram negative bacteria in our next um, slide set. We're going to focus on gram positives first. An example, if you're visual like me and you need to see an image for like, what do these shapes look like? When I mentioned cocci, I literally mean a sphere uh, versus rod. I mean, actually a rod or bacilli. Um, spirochet has almost this like worm-like quality. Um, spirillium is like in between, between a spirochet and a rod. Um, you can have a hypha and a stalk and a bud. We typically see this honestly with yeast, but there is budding in appendage bacteria. And then filamentous looks like pasta or spaghetti or, or hair. This is an example of what a um, dichotomous key can look like. So this is one used to actually help identify certain bacteria, um, showing gram positive, separating the groupings into cocci and rods. And then they further separated down their cocci as those that are catalase positive and those that are catalase negative. And from there, they then did a coagulase. Um, separation to get stuff aureus on its own. And the bold type um, bacteria in this slide are the ones that we're going to really focus on because these are the most medically important because uh, they are the most pathogenic. So these bold bacteria are the ones that we're going to discuss in this gram positive lecture. A moment on catalase, if you again need to see that visualization, remember catalase is what breaks down H2O2 hydrogen peroxide. Um, so it can be converted into water and oxygen. So it creates that bubbles. Uh, here's your equation and here's your example here. Um, 
if hydrogen peroxide wasn't broken down by catalase, it could be converted by the body into a microbicidal product, um, essentially something that could kill off a bacteria. So the bacteria doesn't want that to happen, hence why it has catalase as an enzyme to avoid those microbicidal products being created. So now getting into our gram-positive cocci, the first group we're going to talk about is the staphylococci group, um, or our staph group. So some general characteristics of this group, um, it's a very common inhabitant of skin and mucous membranes. There are spherical cells that are typically arranged in irregular clusters. Sometimes they're called grape-like clusters. They are gram-positive bacteria. They don't have spores. They don't have flagella, so they're non-motile. They could have capsules. So some species have capsules, some do not. And there's over 31 species. We're going to focus on like three or four. Staph aureus is probably the most important staph species to know. Um, when it's grown, there's large, round, opaque colonies that it grows on agar plates. It is coagulase positive, which means it can coagulate cells together. Um, it's a facultative anaerobe, so it can deal with oxygen, so it's catalase positive. It can deal with also high salt, um, extremes in pH and high temp. Um, you can grow it on a sheep blood agar plate. And we typically carry it on our skin and in our nasopharynx as normal flora. There's lots of virulence factors with Staph aureus. And I do have a moment on coagulase, just if you're wanting to know, um, it allows the conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And so it's able to essentially cover its surface with fibrin when in contact with the blood. And this can be a way that it can avoid phagocytosis because it can kind of wall itself off and create an abscess. So this is one of Staph aureus's specialized uh, characteristics that it has. So what are some of these virulence factors? So coagulase is one of them. It can coagulate plasma and blood, um, and it's a diagnostic test. It's really unique for Staph aureus, this coagulase enzyme. Uh, penicillinase can inactivate penicillin, so that's how we can get our MRSA strain, our um, resistant Staph aureus. Protein A, I already mentioned that before, binds to our IgG antibody and can prevent um, opsonization and therefore phagocytosis. It does have hemo hemolysins, so it can break apart um, red blood cells. It can lyse red blood cells, so it's hemolytic in nature. And it does have a um, tox toxic shock syndrome toxin, so a uh, exotoxin. This is a it's super antigen version, so essentially it's going to cause a large um, inflammatory response. And when you see um, toxic shock syndrome toxin, the super antigen form, this is what leads to toxic shock syndrome. So this would be your toxic shock syndrome exotoxin. Um, it also can release um, toxins that can cause rapid onset food poisoning within 30 minutes to six hours. Um, it's not contagious, uh, so it's not something that you'd pass from one person to the next if it's a food poisoning event. Uh, scalded skin syndrome is a toxin-mediated virulence factor, so exotoxin mediately, essentially your skin starts to peel off. It looks pretty painful. And then this um, is the, the super question. agent. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I have a question about the last slide. Yeah. Um, are the Staph aureus hemolysins, the alpha, beta, gamma, are those um, similar to the strep ones where it's like partial, com complete? Okay. Yes. And okay. so we'll see that Staph aureus does beta hemolysis. And so when we look at our strep species, I'll define those for us, but it is the similar hemolytic nature to that strep species, even though typically we think of strep as being our hemolytic bacteria. Excellent. Dr. Pecho, so um, protein A is a um, membrane bound protein, right? Correct. Doesn't get released. Okay, cool. Yes. So when the bacteria is floating around and instead of if an antibody was going to come and try to bind, as we see here, these are the green antibodies, protein A will bind to the antibody instead. And so it pre prevents that antibody from flagging it as a bacteria. Right. So, so it can so essentially it. hide out for longer. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Perfect. Excellent. The things that are being released are um, typically these right here, our, our exotoxins, right? These are going to be our, our things released into the, into the world. Excellent. 
So the super antigen, this toxic shock syndrome toxin, the super antigen component, um, it's kind of showing you an image here and I'll talk through what this image is showing, but it's gonna bring together our major histocompatibility um, complex two, MHC2 and the T cell receptor in proximity outside the binding site. And when it does that, it's gonna cause a super strong release of our inflammatory cytokines interferon gamma and IL-2, interleukin-2, which will lead to a shock reaction. Um, you'll also see um, another component is you'll have T cell activation from this. So you'll have more T cells upregulating that are essentially targeting this exotoxin, um, which is gonna produce an even greater re response. And so ultimately what you end up with is toxic shock syndrome, where you have fever, rash, vomiting, disquamation of cells, shock, and even end organ failure in its most extreme sense. But it's all based off of this exotoxin super antigen from Staph aureus. So obviously each pathology of Staph aureus isn't producing all of these responses. It's gonna depend on where Staph aureus was inoculated, the type of infection it's causing, the way that it was ingested or introduced into the body, right? That's going to partially determine which of these virulence factors are really going to affect the human um, at that given time. And of course, multiple can affect the person. I do have to warn you all, um, this, this slide set has some like, you know, pictures of infection. So if you are a little squeamish in the morning, just, you know, maybe close your eyes when we get to these images. And if you think it's cool, then these pictures are for you. Uh, so looking at more of a localized to systemic cutaneous infection, we often think of staph as causing things like cellulitis or skin infections, uh, but it is good at invading the skin through wounds because it is a normal flora on the surface of our skin. So if we have a break in the skin, it can get inside there and then it could potentially cause an infection. So folliculitis, just infection of the hair follicle, furuncle, we think of as a boil. Um, a carbuncle is a larger, more deeper lesion, with which is like a interconnection of multiple furuncles together internally. And then empantigo is bubble-like swellings that can actually break away and peel away, um, separating the epidermis and dermis layer of the skin. And we see this most commonly in newborns um, or younger persons, not as much in older persons. But these are four different ways that Staph aureus can present on the actual surface on the skin. It also can cause more of a systemic infection. Um, it is the most common cause for osteomyelitis. So that would be a good boards piece to kind of put in your brain there. Um, you'll see the infection will start itself off in the metaphysis in the long bones typically, and then abscess would form there. And then bacteremia would be our other major systemic um, complication of Staph aureus. Uh, and we'll see typically the primary origin is from some other infected site or a medical device. Acute endocarditis is possible from a bacteremia from Staph aureus. So we'll see that as a potential complication. Uh, I mentioned toxigenic disease. So food intoxication, toxic shock syndrome or Staph scalded skin syndrome. These are all of our exotoxin caused diseases from Staph aureus. So food intoxication, it would be ingestion of heat stable enterotoxins that would lead to major gastrointestinal distress. This, the scalded skin syndrome is this like really bright red flush with blisters and then the epidermis essentially peeling off, uh, leaving exposed like that really under portion of skin layer or even the dermal layer. Toxic shock syndrome, we already mentioned with the super antigen, but can lead to toxemia and organ failure. But again, these are all exotoxin mediated. So if Staph aureus does not have that exotoxin or does not release that exotoxin, uh, these conditions would not be presenting, would not present. Oftentimes our That's exotoxins, I have one thing and then I'll, I'll get your question. Oftentimes with exotoxins, they have come sometimes from a bacteriophage. So they actually have been um, added to this uh, Staph aureus bacteria or really any bacteria from a bacteriophage that transferred a toxin from one bacteria type to another. So that's sometimes how we can see Staph aureus, one bacteria, have multiple different types of exotoxin diseases, depending on the exotoxin that that bacteria contains. So um, for the different, like I guess more for the cutaneous infections, are those still caused by the exotoxin or is it only the toxigenic ones that are caused Correct. by the exotoxin? 
Correct. So staph aureus itself will cause your cutaneous infections and your systemic infections on its own. You need to have the exotoxin present to have the toxigenic disease. And that is just variable sometimes, like just depends, correct? It'll depend on origin of um, like intoxication, right? So if you're ingesting versus through the skin versus through often the vaginal tract, and then if the actual bacterium has that exotoxin present. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. For the food intoxication, in fact, we don't even have to ingest stuff aureus. You could just ingest the exotoxin left behind and still have a toxigenic disease. That's kind of part, the part of a difference between um, an exotoxin, even an endotoxin. Endotoxin, typically, you're ingesting the bacteria, the bacteria dies, and then you have that endotoxin response. An exotoxin could be released and you could ingest the exotoxin and get a condition or a disease from that exotoxin alone, not necessarily also staph aureus. Great. Other staph species, we have coagulase negative staph. These are often um, more opportunistic infections. So staph epidermidis lives on our skin and in our mucous membranes. It typically doesn't cause issues. Um, one of the ones that's more commonly known for is prosthetic devices and IV catheter infections. So UTIs from those. Uh, you could see an endocarditis or bacteremia, but I would more associate it with the prosthetic devices and IV catheters. Um, staph hominis lives around our apocrine sweat glands. Again, typically doesn't cause disease. Staph capitis on your scalp, face, and ear. Um, any of them, if the wound or the surface of the skin is open, it could penetrate through broken skin and cause an, a superficial infection. But again, typically these live in harmony with us unless if there's some opportunistic event that occurs. Staph saprophyticus um, doesn't typically live on the skin. It typically lives more in the intestine, the vagina, and it can cause UTIs. Um, but it's typically not found on the skin as much as the other three staph species. This is just showing, again, a breakdown between catalase and coagulase. And we're going to move into our next grouping here of our strep. The so strep's going to be our next gram-positive cocci. Okay. So strep. It's gram positive. It's also um, typically cocci. It can be a little bit more ovoid in nature. So it might not be as quite a sphere as strap or a staff. Um, and it's more likely to be seen in longer chains or in pairs. So diplococci. It does not form spores. It is not motile. It can form capsules. It can form slime layers. So it can make a biofilm. It's facultative anaerobe. So it is able to deal with oxygen, but it does not form catalase it instead uses peroxidase to deal with oxygen species. And there's over 25 species of cocci. So I think someone mentioned earlier um, the different ways that our streptococci bacteria can cause hemolysis or um, a hemolytic nature. And there's two ways we can kind of classify strep. One is based off of Lancefield classification. That's its cell wall antigens. We don't often use Lancefield here. The other is by its hemolysis status, whether it's um, alpha hemolytic, beta hemolytic, or gamma hemolytic. Um, and we can see if you are growing out our strep, so this is our catalase test, catalase negative, so we know it's a strep, growing it out um, to see is it beta hemolytic or is it alpha hemolytic. Beta hemoly hemolysis, um, we'll see, is going to be a more complete hemolysis than alpha hemolysis. And so um, we'll be able to then see the types from there. So our beta hemolysis, I think I have, yeah. Beta hemolysis, I have our strep pyogenes, and then some other beta hemolytic strep, so strep agalactiae is one. Our alpha hemolysis, we'll see our strep pneumoniae, and then another grouping that we collectively call strep viridans that actually has multiple species within it. So these are our main kind of two types of hemolysis that you'll see with strep. If you remember strep pyogenes and strep agalactiae is a beta hemolytic strep, and strep pneumoniae is an alpha hemolytic strep, that's a pretty good separation to start with for our strep species. But we'll look at these further. So again, beta hemolytic are group A strep, which is strep pyogenes, and then group B and C strep, alpha hemolytic strep pneumoniae, and then strep viridam. And we can kind of see the differences between the two. Alpha are beta hemolytic, and then alpha hemolytic. Okay. 
So looking at our first group, this is going to be, we're going to start with strep pyogeny. So our beta hemolytic strep pyogenes or group A hemolytic strep. This would be our most serious strep pathogen, and it inhabits our throat, our nasopharynx, and sometimes the skin. And there's some major diseases that we can look at here. So our pyogenic um, diseases really causing like that inflammatory response is our pharyngitis, our cellulitis, and empetigo. So it is another cause of empetigo like staph aureus was. Our toxigenic, meaning that it's involving an exotoxin, is scarlet fever, our toxic shock-like syndrome, and necrotizing fasciitis. And then immunologic, because it's caused some immune system complication, as we'll see, is our rheumatic fever and our acute glomerulonephritis. So we'll look at these diseases a little bit further, a little bit closer, but these are the main diseases that are caused by strep pyogenes, group A, beta hemolytic strep pyogenes. So why is it so virulent? What are some of its virulence factors? Well, it has lots of surface antigens on top. We can see it has all kinds of antigens present. Um, it also contains fimbriae that allow it to adhere to surfaces, mucous membranes, and other places very well. Uh, the C carbohydrates that are present on the surface, so there's a, a surface antigen, protect against lysozyme breakdown, which is one of the things that our phagocytes or phagocytosis try to use. Our M proteins also can prevent uh, phagocytosis as well. And it has a hyaluronic acid capsule, which is un identifiable to the immune system, at least for a while. So it can decrease the immune response, allowing it to hide out for a longer period of time. These exotoxins that I mentioned that are involved, we have streptolysin, um, pyrogenic toxin, and superantigen. So streptolysins are hemolysins. Uh, the streptolysin O and streptolysin S, SLO and SLS, both cause cell and tissue injury. Um, and you can actually use some of them to diagnose infections, antigens to the strep toxins or streptolysins. Pyrogenic toxin is erythrogenic. It's going to induce fever and a, typically a red rash. So we see this with scarlet fever. And our super antigen is going to cause a huge immune response with our monocytes and our lymphocytes. It'll release interferon gamma and interleukin-1, which are our big, two of our big inflammatory cytokines. So if we look at the skin, the different infections on the skin, empetigo or pyroderma, um, we'll see these superficial lesions. They break and form a highly contagious crust. Um, we'll see it often spreading amongst young kids. You could also see it associated with insect bites, poor hygiene, or crowded living situations. Um, and you could have glomerulonephritis as a possible sequelae, even for empetigo. A throat infection that's classic would be strep pharyngitis, uh, strep throat, uh, rheumatic fever, and glomerulonephritis are possible sequelae for an untreated strep throat infection. So let's look at the systemic disease then. Scarlet fever. So strep pyogenes um, that has, it's a strain of strep pyogenes that carries a prophage that codes for a pyrogenic toxin prophage related to bacteriophage, right? So again, this is a specific strain of S. pyogenes that has this toxin can lead to this red rash, this bright scarlet fever, strawberry tongue, scarlet red throat. Um, we can also see if the strep pyogenes has the streptococcal-like toxoid. Um, it can create streptococcal toxic shock-like syndrome. Or we can even see um, PANDAS, the Pediatric Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorder associated with a strep infection, either non-treated or as just a complication or sequelae. Rheumatic fever, um, typically we'll see kind of, I mean, they're not going to see it that often, but they like to test you on it for MPLEX, so we'll, we'll talk about it. Uh, but oftentimes rheumatic fever will follow either an overt or a subclinical pharyngitis in kids. Um, you can then see a complication of carditis, inflammation of the heart, and then valvular damage. Uh, you may also see arthritis, chorea, and fever. And there's the Jones criteria that you can recall for rheumatic fever, which involves joints, nodules, erythema marginata, which is a rash, and Sindahan's chorea. And we'll look at those when we have our pathology section. I have some of these kind of high-yield weird pathologies um, or pathophysiologic components next weekend. We'll look at that. 
And then lastly, our other systemic disease is acute glomerulonephritis. Um, this is obviously affecting our kidney. We can see an effect in blood pressure and uh, you can have kidney failure. And this would be due to your antibody antigen complexes being deposited at that glomerulofiltration membrane, disrupting the membrane and causing that inflammation and that leakage of protein through the um, membrane space. We can kind of see this here, right? This is our glomerular capillary. Um, here's our antibody, our antigen, our immune complex. It's disrupting that um, membranous glomerulopathy. So it's disrupting that normal filtration membrane. So another type of strep, our group B streptococcus eglactiae, it's also beta hemolytic. It resides regularly in the human vagina. And it can be transferred to an infant during delivery, which could cause a severe infection, um, group B for babies. That's how I remember that. Uh, it's the most prevalent cause of neonatal pneumonia, sepsis, and meningitis. So that's a key note for NPLEX. This is why we screen pregnant women and we treat pregnant women. Uh, you could potentially see a complication of like a wound or skin infection or endocarditis in someone who's immunocompromised, but really... Group B, strep agliactiae, it's beta hemolytic, B for babies, most prevalent cause of neonatal pneumonia, sepsis, and meningitis. Then we have our strep viridans group, our alpha hemolytic strep viridans group. This is a complex group that contains multiple different subgroups, and it has the most come like most of them are occurring in the gums, teeth, oral cavity. You can also find them elsewhere, but we often think about them associated with the teeth. Um, mutans, strep mutans can cause dental caries. And so it has this like bioadhesive that can stick to the teeth. It can become liberated after dental work and then move through the blood and go into heart valves. So we think of often strep, strep viridans as the potential cause for an endocarditis, but typically it's not very invasive. Typically it will just stay in the oral cavity and it won't cause really any issues unless if there's like dental work done or something done to disrupt its, um, its normal life where it hangs out. Looking at the Viridans group again, um, again, the most serious infection that can happen would be a subacute endocarditis um, from dental work, essentially. If you had a pre-existing heart disease or heart condition, that would be the person who would be the most high risk for this. And the bacteria can form a biofilm, so it, it can be really good at preventing itself from being found and from being able to be broken down by the immune system. All right, moving into our next strep group. We're doing good. This is strep pneumonia. These are small, more lancet shaped cells and they're typically in pairs or short chain. Uh, you could use blood or chocolate agar and they don't have catalase um, and or peroxidase. So these cultures will die in oxygen, which is quite interesting. And they are going to cause almost all bacterial pneumonias, meningitis, otitis media, and sinusitis. So how? What do they do? All of the pathogenic strains of strep pneumonia form these major capsules, which is a virulence factor. They also have IgA protease, so they're able to break down and adhere to mucosal membranes because they're not bound by that antibody. Um, you also can, they're alpha hemolytic, um, optogen is just an antibiotic, which is why I'm skipping this because they often don't test you about antibiotics on the MPLEX one. Um, but I would really, I mean, really kicker here is your strep pneumonia. Think of your pneumonia, obviously. I think that one's easy and it's alpha hemolytic and it has IgA, proteases. Our group D, our enterococci, our bovis um, group. So we have kind of two subgroups, strep bovis on its own, and then our enterococcus group. Um, this is a normal colonist of the human gut. It can cause opportunistic infections to kind of the urinary system, the biliary system, or even subacute endocarditis, but typically it's not causing a lot of issues in a healthy person. Strep bovis is in the gut as well and can cause subacute endocarditis in a colon cancer patient. I uh, think bovis in the blood, cancer in the colon. That's my best way to remember that. All right, this is the fun part. So this is where we can kind of check to see how we've been doing with our strep and staff categories. So I encourage you to do like a one, two, three, four, or write down your answers on paper or whatever you want. I'll essentially like read the question. Um, I'll give a pause. If you want to even type it in the chat for accountability, go for it. And then we'll we'll go through the answer. 
Our first question is, a female infant was born prematurely after rupture of membranes and within one day of birth developed fever and died. The pregnant mother had been cultured just prior to the birth of her child and her vaginal culture revealed group B strep S galactii. Uh, which test would provide the most rapid and useful info? Would it be a direct gram stain um, with C in the CSF of the infected neonate? Would it be a blood agar plate to dem demonstrate a diffuse spadohemolysis due to the group B strep from the CSF? Would it be the brain at the autopsy demonstrating an acute hemorrhagic response to strep A galactiae? Or would it be brain section with blood vessel occluded by a group B strep? So I'll give you a minute to think and to look. Remember, we're looking for rapid and useful. Anyone have any guesses they've typed in the chat? I can't see the chat. Maybe I should open up the chat. Oh, good. All right. Group B for baby. Yep, there you go. But is that going to be the answer? I don't know. Let's see. The answer is going to be A. And which is which group B for baby is correct though. So this is a baby one. Um, so A is the answer. So why A? So this is the most rapid and useful info. So which, wh what are these are not rapid? I mean, we can rule out a couple, right? Brain autopsy, that's not rapid. Brain section, not rapid. We're gonna have to cut out pieces and check things. So then we have plate and stain. And so with just this rapid piece, I'm saying like I can do a stain in 10 minutes it's going to take me a couple days to grow out a plate because the bacteria has to grow on it. So by rapid, I know A is good. Then I'm like, well, is it going to be useful information? So I'm like, okay, well, gram stain would give me gram positive growth versus gram negative, and it'll give me morphology. It doesn't necessarily like hone in or hone out other bacteria super well. Blood agar plate would probably be the best because I could really see that beta hemolysis but it's gonna take longer. So that's how A is the best answer because it's the most rapid and it provides the most useful information the quickest. This would be the most accurate at discerning the specific type of strep would be the blood agar plate, but it's not rapid. Again, like such a good NPLEX question, right? Oh, so good. Okay, so good, but so bad. All right, group B strep sepsis in an infant is preventable. Which of the following procedures is most likely to reduce the incidence of group B strep disease? So again, we're looking for what procedure is going to reduce our incidence. Is it intrapartum antibiotic treatment, use of a polysaccharide vaccine, screening of pregnant females in the third trimester, identification of possible high-risk births, screening of pregnant females at the first office visit, usually during the first trimester. So what would reduce the incidence? This is a public health and epidemiology question, so it is fair game. All right. Locked in our answers. Our best way to reduce incidence would be intrapartum antibiotic treatment. So we're trying to incidence, right? We're trying to prevent episodes of, from occurring. And so if we're trying to, if it's a procedure, trying to prevent episodes from occurring, uh, actual antibiotic treatment would be the best treatment, right? The best procedure. Screening would be great. That would give us prevalence but that's not going to reduce our insulin. It's just going to tell us, it's actually going to potentially increase it, right? It's going to tell us more people that have it. So this is great in regards to telling us who has the condition, but it's not actually reducing it, reducing that incidence amount. Um, screening in third trimester, you know, we don't have a lot of time to prevent it. ID of possible high-risk births, sure, but that's not specific to this. Uh, vaccine, again, could be helpful at prevention, but not incident specifically to be preventing mom from getting it and then passing it to baby. So again, incidents, actually reducing those episodes, intrapartum antibiotic treatment is the best answer. You might not like the answer, but it is the best answer. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I know it's tricky. It's gotten us. It's good. All right. A box of ham sandwiches with mayonnaise. Yum prepared by a person with a boil on his neck, was left out of the refrigerator on the for the on-call interns. Those poor interns. Three doctors became violently ill approximately two hours after eating the sandwiches. The most likely cause is. All right, so you have all kinds of craziness happening. So is it a staph aureus enterotoxin? Is it coagulase from staph aureus in the ham? 
Is it leukocytin? Is it a uh, clostridium perfringens toxin? Or is it penicillinase given to inactivate the penicillin in the pork? I don't know. Which one is it? What seems the most likely? A couple clues. Timing is one thing. But your person and your mayonnaise. So if you said your staph aureus from enterotoxin, you are correct, right? Remember, enterotoxin can just be ingested on its own, doesn't even have to be with staph aureus, so it, but it could be. That boil on his neck, that person probably had the had staph on his skin, staph infection, and then left out that beautiful ham sandwich mayonnaise combo um, out of the refrigerator, just letting it sit and do its thing. So staph aureus just started dividing, released that enterotoxin, and here we go. We got a nice, beautiful ham sandwich disgusting thing yeah katie it is gross sorry what does the okay. leukocytin do what is that can you remember i don't know if it i mean it may just be a full detractor but let's just double check um not all those things are are real but i think so this one is um just leukocyte destruction tissue necrosis so leukocytin destroys leukocytes but it is true. It is in staph aureus. It's a virulence factor. So it didn't have to do with the mayonnaise. It had to do with the boil. Well, the boil is how we got the staph. And then we left it and that got exposed there. And then we left it out in two hours. And that's how staph was able to release its enterotoxin. Was that heat delay. Staph just started secreting its enterotoxin. And that's why you get the, the gastroenteritis. You wouldn't expect gastroenteritis from leukocytin. There was no signs or symptoms of, of clostridium perfringens. Um, there's no coagulase from staph aureus. Coagulase wouldn't cause the gastrointestinal upset. And then that doesn't make sense. That's just a detractor. Because there's no penicillin in the pork. Great. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Staph aureus causes a wide variety of infections, ranging from wound infection to pneumonia. Treatment of staph aureus infection with penicillin is often complicated by is it the inability of penicillin to penetrate the membrane of staph aureus? Is it the production of penicillase by staph aureus? Production of penicillin acetylase by staph aureus? The lack of penicillin binding sites on staph aureus? Or the allergic reaction caused by staph protein? So remember, it's virulence factors, staph aureus, pretty virulent. So inability of penicillin to penetrate the membrane of staph aureus. So staph aureus itself um, has a really, really thick membrane, and it's actually it does not let um, the penicillin uh, antibiotic penetrate within the membrane of staph aureus. Penicillase is a great answer, but does staph aureus produce penicillinase? I think it's on one of the slides. Yeah. I think yeah. it does too. Yeah. So I think yeah. B is also a good answer as well. So that's why I love this question because I think A and B are accurate. So this is a question for your NPLEX joys or woes where you would probably choose B and I would say B is correct. And I also would say A is correct. And it's going to depend on what NPLEX has decided. And so this question could get thrown out in an NPLEX exam, but that's the beauty of these type of questions and the frustration. None of these other ones are correct though. These two are accurate. All right. Acute hematogenous osteomyelitis is often diagnosed by isolation of the organism by the blood and is most common or most caused most often by, and we have our, our five here, hematogenous spread, so spread via the blood, not via the surface. And our answer is going to be staph aureus, which we talked about earlier. Most common cause of osteomyelitis. All right. 28-year-old menstruating woman appeared in the emergency room with the following signs and symptoms. A fever, white blood cell count, blood pressure low, um, a scarlet form rash on her trunk, palms and soles, really extreme fatigue, vomiting, and diarrhea. The patient described in this case most likely has is it scalded skin syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, Guillain-Barre syndrome, chickenpox, or staph food poisoning. Remember, 
She has a fever, a high fever, white blood cell count, low blood pressure, the rash, fatigue, vomiting, and diarrhea. I think we can rule out three and you're really just looking for, there's two options that are close. And it's scalded skin syndrome. If you said toxic shock syndrome, I love that for you, but scalded skin syndrome because of the scarlet form rash on her trunk, palms, and soles. Um, vomiting, diarrhea, fatigue, fever, you can see in both these conditions, but that rash, um, that's your pathognomonic for your scalded skin syndrome in this case. Right. They tried to pull you by a menstruating woman because we want to go like, oh, it must be toxic shock. All right. Culture of the menstrual fluid in this case cited would most likely reveal what? So if we cultured the fluid in this case, what would we expect to have? We'd expect staph aureus. That's the most common cause of scalded skin. Um, the most characteristic finding not yet revealed in the case just presented would be if they traveled to Vermont, if they recently had exposure to rubella, a retained tampon, heavy menstrual flow, a meal of chicken in a fast food restaurant. A retained tampon, because then we say, what the frick? Why isn't it? Why, why do not also have toxic shock syndrome? And in fact, the patient could be developing both. So if we had this piece, this characteristic finding in the case, the previous case, we would call it toxic shock syndrome instead of scalded skin. My favorite and least favorite. Recently, there have been sensational media reports of patients infected with invasive flesh-eating bacteria that spread rapidly through the tissues. This necrotizing fasciitis is usually caused by, you have a couple options. You said group A strep, that is correct. When we think of necrosis, we're actually a bacteria that causes necrotic lesions. Think about hemolysis, the breakdown of the actual tissue. Uh, your strep species are going to be your best bet for that type of um, category. Versus staph aureus, think of abscesses, think of boils, think of walling off, collecting in that nature. Rheumatic fever is a disease seen in children and young adults. Which one of the following statements best typifies the disease? It's characterized by inflammatory lesions that may involve the heart, joints, and subcutaneous tissues, and the central nervous system. Uh, the pathogenesis is related to the similarity between a staph antigen and human cardiac antigen. Uh, prophylaxis with benzathine penicillin is of little value. It is a complication of group A strep skin disease, but usually not of pharyngitis. It is very common in developing countries, but extremely rare and decreasing in the instance in the United States. So which one of these would we say typifies, best typifies the disease or typifies? And it's A, which is correct, uh, is that inflammatory lesions can involve heart joints, subcutaneous tissues, and the CNS. So we see all of those pieces with our rheumatic fever, that Jones criteria. Staph aureus has a distinctive appearance on which of the following media. I don't think I really, I mentioned this that much, but it is sheep's blood agar. I don't think they'd ask you a direct question like that. Which of the following is the most predominant organism on skin commonly seen as a blood culture contaminant? We see that being staph epidermis or staph epidermidis being our most common um, organism on the skin, normal flora typically. If we had a crack in the skin that got into the blood, then we could see it as a blood culture contaminant. Our strep mutans, um, a facultative anaerobe that often inhabits the buccal mucosa early in the neonate's life and can cause bacterial endocarditis. A beta hemolytic organism causes a diffuse rapidly spreading cellulitis. Anaerobic filamentous bacterium that often causes cervicofacial osteomyelitis, facultative anaerobe that's highly carcinogenic and sticks to teeth, or karyogenic and sticks to teeth by synthesis of a dextran, or facultative anaerobic rod shaped bacterium that sticks to teeth and is karyogenic. So D and E are really close. 
And so the answer is D. It's the best answer because it is highly karyogenic. It sticks to teeth by synthesis of a dextran. That is actually how it sticks to the teeth, which was mentioned there before. But these are so close. I mean, that's just like horrid how close those are. Okay. I act like I didn't write these questions, but all right. We're going to move on from our coccy here in a moment, but I wanted to just check in and test the pulse and see how we're feeling. Cause I know after doing some of these questions, it can get quite frustrating. How are we feeling? Honestly, I, even though it was kind of frustrating, it was helpful too, because now I can see where like they might try to trick us or detract us. Um, and like one of my, like weaknesses is just kind of figuring out what is pertinent and what is like trying to distract me so that was helpful to see where that could be and where it could come up and like why like carefully reading the question is very important so it was helpful yeah yeah and that's again like all my top recommendation for mplex is always read the question first and try to come up with an answer in your brain as you're reading it before you look at the the responses because the responses will often detract you more than the question intends, right? The question, you might be able to get to kind of an answer, but you look at the answer choices and it pulls you a different way. So if you can get to that practice of reading the question first and then, yeah, exactly with the tampon answer, I agree. And then you might go back and change it, right? But I think um, if you could read the question first, answer it kind of in your brain, then look through the answer choices that, and then if you know that you're a good first guesser, don't go back and change change answers. If you're not a good first guesser, then you could maybe go back and change an answer or two. But if you know you're a good first guesser, which most people are, um, I encourage you don't go back and change them, right? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to get into some spores. I want to do a little bit of gram positive bacilli before we take our next break. So we'll go for another like 14 minutes and then we'll break um, at 10 after. So our spore versus non-spore. So those were our gram-positive cocci. Now we're looking at our gram-positive bacilli, which are rod-like bacteria. And if we look at our spore formers, we're really gonna look at our bacillus and our clostridium species. And then there's more genus, or I guess genus, and then there's more species. And then our non-spore formers, we'll look at our listeria and our corneobactrum. So spores, a reminder, remember it. It's a way to put that um, bacteria in like a, animated or a non-animated state where it's able to just hang out. It's not dividing. It's not actively alive or dead, but it's not doing really any metabolism at all. It's just waiting for the appropriate metabolic conditions to return so it can move back to become a vegetative cell. They are really dangerous because they're resistant to heat and chemicals. You have to autoclave these to kill them. So they can hang out in their spore forming way for a long period of time. Bacillus anthracis and cerus is the two bacilli species we'll look at. And then Clostridium tetani, botulinum perfringens, and difficile. We'll look at those four species. A main way to differentiate is bacillus is aerobic, meaning it's oxygen loving, needs oxygen to thrive and survive, versus Clostridium is anaerobic. It is oxygen fearing. It does not like oxygen. So looking at our bacillus species first, these are found in nature, hence why they like oxygen. Um, most of these are isolated as contaminants. Um, others could be opportunists in the body. And so we'll see the two main types. Bacillus anthracis is anthrax, um, an agent of anthrax. We see this more commonly in livestock. Um, humans can acquire infection by either ingesting, getting it into a wound, or inhaling the spores. So those are kind of the three entry points for bacillus anthracis. Bacillus cerus is typically caused by food poisoning, and it's an opportunistic pathogen. So looking at anthracis, um, on a gram stage, they have large square ending gram positive rods. They almost have a bamboo like appearance. And then these pink are the spores. Uh, they are non hemolytic uh, on the blood agar. And they have kind of these like finger like edges. So we call them beaten egg whites or medusa heads. That's how they're described on blood agar. Don't think they'll probably um, ask these type of questions. They may ask more stain based questions. Often they don't ask agar based questions because they don't expect you to have grown out these on your own. So some general characteristics, um, the, the spores can live up to 50 years. I already mentioned that they're non-hemolytic. 
They have a polypeptide capsule that's part of their valence factor, so they can hide out to not be found by the immune system. They also have three exotoxins. Remember, they're gram positive, so exotoxins. They have edema factor, EF, um, protective antigen, PA, and lethal factor, LF. So those are their three endo exotoxins that they can um, express. So anthracic infection in humans, the cutaneous or contact anthrax um, organs gain access through cuts. And this is typically a localized infection, although it can cause tissue necrosis. Uh, pulmonary anthrax inhaled um, of spores, and this will lead typically to the respiratory distress and death. Um, and GI, this is ingestion of contaminated or raw meat. Um, and again, a big gastrointestinal response. All Any of these could potentially cause death, this via necrosis, this via respiratory distress, and this via gastrointestinal distress leading to um, diarrhea, dehydration, hemorrhage, that road. So looking here, um, the classic lesion of cutaneous anthrax is um, a pain painless ulcer with black necrotic S-char um, and local edema surrounding. So not great. Uh, obviously untreated will lead to death and bacteremia. Pulmonary anthrax, I've never seen it as Wolsorder's disease on your MPLEX, um, but it's life-threatening pneumonia, essentially. Uh, you'll have flu-like symptoms, pulmonary hemorrhage, and shock. Moving into Bacillus cirrus, this is your um, food poisoning bacillus species. These are motile. They do not have a capsule. Um, so that makes them relatively unique. And this is your rice, the disease. So your fried rice that you heat it up, you let kind of cool off. You didn't put it in the fridge right away. And then you let it just like sit at room temperature for a while, and then you heat it back up again. Uh, that's that's the classic setup for a Bacillus cirrus infection. Uh, it's rare that you have uh, a meningitis or osteomyelitis from this. Typically, it's a gastroenteritis. Transmission is from the spores on the grains of rice that survive during steaming and rapid frying. They germinate when the rice is kept warm. Because remember, this is a spore forming bacteria, and you have to autoclave it to survive to have it survive, have it not have it die. So it can live for a long time if these spores are present. Um, and the longer the rice is kept kind of at that warm room temp, the more likely the spores are to germinate and to then cause their disease. Their portal of entry is the GI tract. So your findings is a severe emetic syndrome. So typically four hours after you eat it, nausea, vomiting, uh, typical to like similar to staph poisoning. So it can look very similar, but like rice would be your, um, your portal of entry. You can also have a diarrheal syndrome. This is longer, about 18 hours, and it's non-bloody, and it looks more like a clostridial gastroenteritis that we'll, we'll look at here in a moment. Um, so those are your kind of two versions that you could have. Short version for vomiting, uh, looking like staph food poisoning, longer incubation for diarrhea, and it's non-bloody diarrhea. So looking at the difference between anthracis and cirrus, uh, hemolysis only for uh Cirrus, not for anthracis. Uh, motility, uh, cirrus is, wait, hold on. Let me just confirm here. Yeah, okay, good. I was like, wait a second. Let me just, can confirm. Cirrus is motile, anthracis is non-motile. I just wanted to make sure my equal signs did indeed mean negative. String of pearls sign, anthracis versus cirrus. This would be on um, slide. Uh, growth on that specific type of media. I don't think that would matter. Gelatin hydrolysis shouldn't matter. It just means it eats the gelatin. And susceptibility to penicillin, I guess that could matter. Anthracis, you can take penicillin. Cirrus is resistant. But I think these two are more important. That's your bacillus anthracis. Okay. So bacillus species, anthrax, um, know the three ways of entry. Uh, know that they are spore forming. They typically cause death um, if not treated. Uh, for your cirrus, no rice, gastroenteritis. That's really what I'd put in with your, your bacillus cirrus. Your clostridium species, on the other hand, these are also spore forming. They're gram positive. They're obligate anaerobic bacilli. So they can do either. Um, so an obligate anaerobe means that they have to be away from oxygen. So they cannot be around oxygen. So different than our bacillus species. And we'll have three species here, tetany, botulinum, perfringens, and difficile. So Clostridium tetany or tetani, um, we'll see they have flagella. Um, this is just the specific type, kind of what they look like. Uh, they'll also have a terminal spore. 
and their disease is tetanus or lockjaw. Transmission, we classically think about rusty nail, but it's because the spores are commonly found in the soil. And so the portal of entry is a wound site. Um, from there, the spores, once in a wound site, can germinate because they're away from oxygen. Um, so they're favored by poor blood supply and tissues and wounds, and they create kind of a nice necrotic uh, tissue space because they don't want oxygen around. So they try to create a space that's free of blood. Um, poor blood supply is ideal for these uh, spores, for Clostridium tetany. So our tetanus toxin is probably the most famous toxin because it's uh, it causes it's our tetanospasmin. Uh, we have a retrograde carry to the central nervous system where it's able to bind to our receptors, blocking the release of inhibitory mediators like GABA or glycine at spinal synapses. This leads to a hyperreflection and a spastic paralysis. We essentially have, we can think about um, the inability of things to let go because we don't have that inhibitory response to say, stop stimulating. So you have this spastic contraction where you're constantly being stimulated at these um, neurotransmitter spaces or these neuromuscul neuromuscular junctions because you've taken away the inhibitory mediators. You've blocked that inhibitory space. Okay. So clinically, the incubation period can be four to five days to several weeks and your clinical findings are muscle spasms at the site of infection and then the jaw becoming locked. Uh, lock jaw or trismus due to the contraction of the jaw rigidly, that inability to release prevents the mouth from being open. And then you'll see blood pressure drop, respiratory failure, and eventually the positioning, the classic tetanus positioning of everything's arched back and cannot release. You're in this kind of classic position that we associate with tetany. Needle natal tetanus, again, showing the spastic paralysis of the intravertebral muscles, like locking the back into this rigid arched position. Typically a baby you're not seeing, being able to have that neuromuscular control. And again, if you're like visual like me and want to you know, follow it up, you got your nail, your tack, your low bacterium kind of moving up there, going into the actual spinal cord, those toxin molecules affecting these inhibitory neurons here preventing them from essentially allowing inhibition to occur. So you just have upregulation of your muscles. Okay, that's your tetanus toxin, spastic paralysis. Clostridium botulinum, on the other hand, this is going to be our flaccid paralysis. Toxin will cause um, botulism. It's also anaerobic, gram-positive, rod-shaped bacteria. It has spores as well. It can remain dorm dormant for like 30 years. Um, they're really resistant to all kinds of environmental stressors. So one way we could find this is foodborne botulinum. Um, this is from eating foods that contain botulism toxin. Uh, you could also have intestinal botulism. This is often seen in little kiddos or even children or adults. Uh, this is caused by ingesting the spores of the bacteria. And then those spores germinate um, and produce the toxin actually in the intestine. So this was eating the toxin directly. This was eating the spores and the spores germinate inside of you. Yikes. Wound botulinum, uh, the spores germinate actually in your wound. And inhalation botulinum, uh, it's aerosolized, the toxin is, and it's inhaled. This would be bioterrorism. So this would not be occurring naturally. So when this one happens, uh, for incubation, if it's foodborne, it's about six hours to eight days wound four to 14 inhalation really quick. Um, the toxin will enter in your bloodstream from the mucosal surface or the wound. It'll bind to your peripheral cholinergic nerve endings and it'll inhibit your release of acetylcholine. So it's blocking acetylcholine release. Therefore, if there's no acetylcholine being released at your neuro neuromuscular junction, your muscles, skeletal muscles cannot contract because they don't have that acetylcholine binding to those muscarinic receptors. So therefore you have symmetrical descending paralysis that occurs beginning with the cranial nerves and it moves downward, okay? Versus another condition where you can see um, a kind of more of a, a flaccid paralysis or at least a decreased movement is Guillain-Barre, but it moves upward typically. But pathogenesis here, so we compare oftentimes Clostridium botulinum and Clostridium tetany, totally different mechanisms 
both toxins, both same genus, different species, different action, right? Tetany, you're blocking an inhibitory piece. So your muscles are constantly contracting. They can't let go. They're spastic versus botulinum. You can't even release the neurotransmitter needed in the first place. So you have this flaccid paralysis. Contraction can't exist. And so our, our classic symptoms of botulinum, um, blurred or double vision. So we start seeing cranial nerve issues, right? Muscle weakness, droopy eyelids, slurred speech, trouble swallowing. Um, you're not febrile, you're alert. Uh, infants will have kind of a weak cry, poor feed, constipation, and then floppy baby syndrome, hypotonia. Okay. So we'll stop here. We'll take our, our um, 10 minute break here at Clostridium perfringens. So we'll come back at 1120 and we'll finish out, probably we can get through the rest of the Clostridium species as well as a few more of the gram positives. We may even be able to get through the rest before lunch. So we'll come back at 1120 and then we'll um, fly through the rest of our gram positive bacteria. Um, Dr. Petra, I have one mm -hmm. more question about the um, botulinum. So yeah. If you want to go back really quick. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Clostridium botulinum, that's also the same bacteria used for like Botox in different, um, like, yes. a, okay. It's the toxin. Different... So we don't use the bacteria, but we use the toxin from okay. that bacteria. We create a synthetic version. And yeah. so you inject it and it's preventing that release of acetylcholine there at that space. And mm -hmm. so you're not allowing those muscles to contract. And so if you don't allow your muscles of like your frontalis muscle, your temporalis muscle to contract, yeah. you will not have wrinkles, right? So there's, it. okay. But it's temporary paralysis because that will eventually diffuse out, the body will break it down and then those muscles are able to contract again. And so then you can get the return of wrinkles to that space. Yeah, excellent. Awesome, perfect. All right, we'll take a break. We'll come back at 1120 and we'll finish up our gram positives.